great preparation. Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving, it's a busy time. It's getting ready the turkey, it's making all the figgy pudding. <laughs> There's the invites, there's the table settings. Tremendous amounts of work go in to the making of a Thanksgiving feast. And yet, when you look at Thanksgiving feasts, there is one thing that if it's missing, what's it all for? And that thing is stuff. <laughs> it is love, of course. It is love. Bishop Sutton, uh, at our mission formation, called us back to the main thing. That this mission was to focus and build our identity around the main thing. And this Advent there is no better time to return to the main thing. You might have noticed in some of my mission emails, the vicar notes, I've been calling us back to this recentering within a busy parish and building, building, building. It is time this Advent to return to what is the main thing. And Bishop Sutton, of course, is right on. Communicating the gospel clearly to those who need it is the main thing. But there is this, this center of all things, of what it means to be a Christian. And that is just one part of it. Today we're going to be talking about the main thing in a different aspect. And that is the internal, the external righteousness. That is the church, the, the church's um, inheritance through Christ. This morning, I'd like to walk us through the paupers uh, and show the message that they give when they're grouped together as they are. This morning, our psalm is Psalm 50. So uh, turn in your booklets to page 5. The context of this psalm is that God is judging the sacrifices of his people. God is judging the sacrifices of his people. Verse 1. The Lord, even the most mighty God, hath spoken. Verse 3. He shall not keep silence. There shall go before him a consuming fire. Verses 4 and 5. He shall call the heaven from above and the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me with sacrifice. Now, it becomes clear in the next several verses that God is judging them not because they are withholding the sacrifices. They are faithful in offering up the required flesh. Verse 8, he says, I will not reprove thee because of thy sacrifices. As for thy burnt offerings, they are ever before me. God is judging his covenant people because the people are not righteous in their ways. Verse 16. Why dost thou preach my laws and take my covenant in thy mouth, whereas thou hatest to be reformed and hast cast my words behind thee? Behind thee. God continues the rebuke by saying that they act like the thief, the adulterer, the deceitful, and the slanderer. God warns them in verse 22. Oh, consider this, ye that forget God, lest I pluck you away, and there be none to deliver you. Whoso offereth me thanks and praise, he honoreth me, and to him that ordereth his way aright will I show the salvation of God. So God judges the sacrifice of his people, and he finds it wanted, because they are not righteous. His people say the required words of the liturgy, and they offer the right animal at the right time, but they don't live their own lives. God says he will pluck them away, and there will be none to deliver them. 
The Old Testament lesson in Malachi 3 has the same theme. God promises he will come to judge his people's sacrifice. On page 7, in the middle of the fourth line, it says, Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appears? Why is he coming? I will come near to you in judgment. And I will be swift, a swift witness against the sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow, and the fatherless, and then turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. It says that he will come suddenly to his temple, the place of sacrifices. Yet the reason for his judgment is a lack of righteousness in his people. So what does he hope to accomplish with this judgment of the temple? It says, He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord. So in the psalm, God brings judgment upon the sacrifices of his people who are unrighteous. And in Malachi 3, God brings judgment upon the unrighteous so that they can offer a righteous sacrifice. Have you heard of the book, The Five Love Languages? What a frustrating book. <laughs> if you if you've ever, ever read it, Chapman distinguishes receiving love in five categories. He says we receive love through acts of service, words of affirmation, receiving gifts, physical touch, and quality of time. And each person has their own love language, their way of receiving love. May God help you if you don't know that your spouse is love language. You could be slaving away, hands cracking and peeling from being assaulted by Don Dish soap. Slave away out of love for your wife. I'm not, this is, has nothing to do with you. <laughs> Forearms burning from endless shoulder rubs. Your voice hoarse from singing ballads to her beauty. <laughs> When what she really wanted was a pair of earrings <laughs> and a cup of joe in the morning. Now the analogy is not perfect, but the point is this. We can work our whole lives for God. But if we don't take the time to learn what is most important, what is the main thing to Him, then we'll find that he is not pleased with us. And this is what happened in this morning's gospel. Jesus came into the city as their king. Some of the people lauded him and welcomed him as king, waving palm branches and spreading out their clothes. Just as the psalm predicted, out of Sion hath God appeared in perfect beauty. Just as Malachi predicted, God came suddenly to his temple. Matthew records, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple. He overthrew the money of the, the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. The gospel so clearly fulfills the prophecy of Malachi. The people thought that God would come and congratulate them, even fight for them against the Romans. Are we not his covenant people? Look at the temple that Herod has built. And yet they found that God's requirement was not in their ability to spout off the 614 laws of Moses or in the size of the temple that they built, 
or in the quantity of animals that they sacrificed. What they discovered is that God has a zeal for righteousness that far exceeded their expectation, and they were not ready for his coming. This is the first Sunday of Advent, the season where the church focuses on preparing for the second coming of Christ. Advent is about getting ready. Jesus is coming back, and it is important that we are ready. For we confess in the creed that he shall come again to judge both the quick and the dead. And what was true of him in the first advent will certainly be true of him in the second advent. Who may abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire. When Jesus returns, he will be looking for a righteous he won't expect, he won't, he won't accept a people who go through the motions, who take his covenant in their mouth, but hate to be changed in their heart. The psalmist says that he will show his salvation to him who orders his way aright. So every year the church, our mother, walks us through this season so that we can prepare and set our lives in order. But it is also crucial that we at CTK hear this message as a mission. Like the people in Jesus' day, we have built, not a temple, but a church. We've developed guilds and teams, trained leaders, established cell groups, crafted mission and vision statements. It's been a fun process. Lots of work. We've even begun to adopt the rhythms of worship, the Eucharist, learn to pray and chant the ancient liturgies, which fulfill the ancient sacrifices. And God is pleased with the work of his people, unless it is in place of the main thing. And the main thing, in a word, is righteousness. What does it mean to be righteous? Well, given that righteousness is what God requires, look at what Jesus, look at look at what causes Jesus in our gospel. What causes Jesus to fly into a holy rage? It's a clue as to what he requires of us, what righteousness means. The money changers in the temple were creating obstacles and distractions for people coming to pray especially foreigners. They were being, as Malachi said, those that turn aside the stranger from his right. In their actions, these temple officials were violating the two great commandments. <coughs> their racket, in both senses of the word, prohibited the stranger from the love of God in prayer. Our Old Testament proverbs make clear that God is zealous for righteousness. In our gospel, Jesus is zealous about two things. Justice towards the stranger and prayer. In other words, the love of neighbor and the love of God. Righteousness. Advent is a season to devote ourselves to prayer ethics, and virtue. God's people are to be a praying people, known for their justice and righteousness. When God returns, he will look at three things. More than that, but at least two. Our hearts, our hands, and our feet. Did our hearts commune with God in prayer throughout the whole course of our lives? Did our hands do justice towards our neighbor? And did our feet walk in the way of the commandments of God? Prayer, ethics, virtue. None of us are where we should be. And this is why God sends messengers 
to prepare us. Malachi starts, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Today is a mercy for us all. You be reminded that God is coming. Be moved to get ready. At some point during Advent, one of your clergy will call you on the phone. And they will discuss with you your prayer life and ask you what virtues you guys are aiming at over the next year. How we can help you, coach you, live with you in this journey towards holiness and righteousness. This too is a kindness. You have been given shepherds and time. But at the end of the day, every man and woman must prepare themselves. For the mystery of righteousness is found in the soil of our heart, where Christ has been planted there by faith. And this is the dawn of a new year. The sun is coming out. Is this cycle of the liturgical year to be one of significant growth for you as a Christian? What is your plan for growing in prayer, ethics, and virtue? May God grant us grace as we venture into this year together, growing in prayer and righteousness, that when Jesus returns to judge the quick and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal in perfect joy and righteousness. Amen.